He says, it's funny you ask. They're watching you. So they had been looking at me. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. There will still be the journey. The journey. New Sheriff in town. Name is the journey. journey. This thing is bigger than Nino Brown. This is the journey. The journey. What is it that moved you? The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. Welcome back to another episode of The Journey. I'm your host, Larry Robinson, and today we got a Memphis icon who's born and bred. Loves Memphis through and through. But before we get to him, we got a Tennessee person who's the author of our quote. And that author is none other than Oprah Winfrey. And it goes a little something like, it, like this. Listen to the rhythm of your own calling and follow that. Now, what does that mean to me? I've asked God to lead me in many ways. And we always hear those voices. But if you don't listen, it means nothing. Listen to your calling and follow that voice because it'll lead you to where you need to go. Now back to our icon. As I said, Memphis born and bred, retired from FedEx 40 years. I mean, he long time, bro. He got, they, got, they got shoes and lockers named after him at FedEx. Former baller, and that's when I met him. I met him at the wide down on, uh, down the Fogelman right. wide downtown, and he put a couple jumpers in my eye. Father, husband, and he's also a pastor, extremely committed to his people, his church, yes. and his community. I'm speaking of none other than Tim Bowers. Thank you, Brother Tim, Bless you, for man. coming on and hanging out with us yes, on the sir. journey. <laughs> Good to be here, Larry. Man, so I, proud of you, brother. Thank you. Thank so you, very thank proud you, of you and everything you. that you're doing here. Well, thank you, man. Um, so let's start back in the early yeah. days, early, early days. Tell me about the neighborhood you grew up with and the inn and the house. North uh, Memphis. Okay, North Memphis. North, North. Born and raised. Okay. Can I say it like I want to? Yeah, say it like you want to. North Memphis. North Memphis. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Stepdad and mom. Okay. Raised me and uncle and aunt raised me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Who's in the household? With My you? two brothers. Okay. I'm the oldest of uh, three boys. Uh-oh. My stepfather, my mother, Shirley Norman Jenkins. Okay. And my brother, Terry and Joseph. Okay. And Joseph Sr. All right, now wait a minute. You are, you the oldest of three. Yes. So was it ever a time that I just got to ask you? Please. You looked at your stepfather and said, "Man, you ain't my daddy." That's amazing that you would ask that. I'm glad you did okay. because it was so seamless. His manhood and humanity that he showed. Mm -hmm. There was never a difference. Obviously, I knew that. Right. But the love was so thick. And the commitment to being a man, really? a Christian man, mm -hmm. I'm the product of that. Really? Yes. I got a buddy of mine, man, and he uh, adopted his um, eventual wife's son. Mm -hmm. And I've always been, I've always admired him. And, that you uh, should. Yeah, and because yeah. of what he's given that young man. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Fabian Matthews, uh, give him some lifetime flowers because mm -hmm. um, I think he's a special brother. Yeah. That can take a man, another man's Well, it's a special person that will do that. Yes, absolutely. And he did that for me for sure. Fantastic. Okay. So who outside of your parents and those in the household had the biggest impact on young Tim? Well, I was very fortunate, Larry, to have this village bridge. Mm. Uncles, aunties. Okay. And in particular, my junior high, I guess they would call it middle school now. Right, right teachers mm -hmm. and coaches okay it was like a template of love okay. and dedication from the house the community school and back okay so the template was the same okay no matter if it was my father my mother okay. the coaches and they were coaches that espouse academics uh -huh. so it was an oasis of possibilities for me early on so my confidence grew Okay. At a very early age. Okay, we ain't gonna sit here and act like Tim done had this life that's been paved with gold. <laughs> we won't we do ain't that. gonna do that. We, now. Do that. we ain't gonna do that. Yeah. So let's get to some nitty gritty. <laughs> Tell me about that time that uh, Tim got that tail warmed up back at, back in North North. That's easy. <laughs> Dad was at work. He worked at Plow. Okay. And I had a friend by the name of Marlon. Okay. We lived in a duplex at the time. Okay. 
and we were buddies and uh -huh. I've always been somewhat of a leader okay. uh, in my space of cousins and what have you. If we were having church, they would always nominate me to be the preacher. You know, here, here, <laughs> here we are. So I couldn't get any more money from mom okay, because we wanted to go to the store to buy some matches. Right. And it was my idea, guilty okay. as charged. Okay. And I said, well, Martin, look, I can't, I can't really get any more money from my mom. So can you ask your mom if you can get a couple of nickels or whatever, and we'll go get some matches. Mm -hmm. And he did. So we go up to the store, the community store. Right. And we come back. And what we wanted to do with those matches, Larry, was not smoke anything. Right. We wanted to build a fire because we were cowboys. And right. We were going to cross our legs and <laughs> have our little campfire. <laughs> So we took the matches out and we were striking the matches mm -hmm. and the fire started, but it was too small. And I said, Martin, look, let's take two at a time. Let's take two at a time and, and <laughs> strike them. And then we put them on the fire and then fire started to grow. I said, man, this is cool. Let's cross our legs. Marlon did everything I said. Uh -huh. He'll make a good member now. <laughs> and we crossed our legs. Uh -huh. And the next thing you know, whew. Oh, my goodness. And we lived on a levee uh -huh. on Calvert in the Crump Douglas community. So in my peripheral down, this girl that I liked, and she liked me, and she ran in the house and told her dad. He came down there, mom came out, and let me tell you, man, we had three huge fire trucks on our street. I mean, it oh just my ablazed. <laughs> and it was my fault. I, <laughs> instigated the whole thing <laughs> okay but here's what i remember about that okay. long time ago marlon wherever you are god bless you brother uh -huh. mom looked at me and she said to me i'm not gonna whoop you i'm gonna wait till your father comes home so all day long i'm stewing oh, yeah, contemplating man, horrible just just waiting just just right. dead man walking right <laughs> so he comes in the house, I'll never forget it. I'm sitting in a chair kind of like this. Uh -huh. Mom talks to him. You know, we didn't have cell phones back right, then, so right. he didn't find out until he got home. Yeah, so right, right. he looks at me and he gave me a look I'll never forget. He never touched me. He never said a word. And of course, I never did that again. Right. But let me tell you something. That look he gave me, was piercing. It was worse than anything. Because he had my unwavering res respect. Right. The kind of man he was, how he governed his household. Right. I'll never forget that. Wow. Joseph Norman Sr., I will never forget that. Wow. The way he looked at me that day. Wow. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how different are you from the person you dreamed you would be as a, as a young man? Well, I have to be honest with you, probably a lot, not a lot different. Okay. It's kind of like uh, here again, that village. Uh -huh. Early on, I learned to love myself. Okay. There was so much love instilled in us. Okay. So the confidence grew early. Okay. And if I can get into my servant leadership platform here, uh -huh. it may be a segue later. Mm -hmm. But something that I would like to share with you is something that I came across at FedEx and something that I've naturally Leo. Okay, well, hold on, hold on. Okay. So we're going we gonna to give you a bigger platform okay. to, to let that okay. out. But the last question I'm asking sure. this segment is, every brother I know has a moment that they can point to, that they can say, that's the moment I realized I was a black man or a black boy. Okay. Or I was black. What was that moment for you? Hold on, hold on, listen. We're going to come right back on the journey where brother Tim's going to tell us when he realized he was a brother. Stay right there. The journey on the Kazookian network. We'll be right back. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. Success in life is not a straight line. There are twists and turns in everyone's life. And the more you know about their story, the more you'll understand the process. Kazookian Media Group proudly presents The Journey, a show that features successful black men in Memphis telling their stories of their lives and the ups and downs they've encountered on their ultimate road to success. We believe The Journey will encourage young men and help them see that life is a journey. Watch The Journey, hosted by me, Larry Robinson. 
brought to you by the Kazuki Media Group in partnership with the Delta Boule. Welcome back to the journey. You know how back in the day when you was boiling a, a pot of water and it started them little bitty bubbles at the bottom as it's about to get into a full rage? That's what we are. We at the little bubble stage and we're about to get into a full <laughs> rage. So listen, we have brother Tim Bowers here today on the journey. And before we left, Tim was sharing with us when he realized he was a black man. But before we go there, I got one simple question, Brother Tim. Yes. What's your superpower? My faith. Okay. And what does that mean? Your faith. How does your faith show up as your superpower? Trust in God when I can't trace him. He's Ooh. working behind the scenes Ooh. and I'm just trying to be Say obedient. That again. Say that. Trust in God when you cannot trace him, meaning unanswered prayers. Okay. The wall, the obstacle to see are there. So you okay. have to trust him when you can't trace him because he's not trying to destroy you by making you wait. He's developing you while he's making you wait. Ooh, that's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Now, if you had to do something, if you could point to something that along your journey that you do better than everybody else, every single body, it's just something that comes natural to you, something that comes easy for you. What would you call that as your superpower? Well, I think God has given me uh, an, in an innate ability to walk in the souls of humanity. My emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. I think, is masterful okay. and it's sincere. Okay. And I'm able to move people and to, to lead people, to empower them, to encourage them, to mm -hmm. lift them up. When did you realize that that was part of who you are? Probably. Because many, many kids. Yes. They have these natural leadership abilities. And you know, sometimes you see it in the dope boy who turns out to be sure. dope boy. You see it as the bully, or you might see it as the basketball, football player. Mm -hmm. Here again, uh, happening at home, uh, parents and family members seeing it in me, mm. teachers and coaches seeing it in me. Uh, Tim, take us out, let us take us out in prayer. Tim, get it front of the line, show us how, demonstrate this it's, it's always been like I was thrust into a servant leadership type of uh, role, mm -hmm. and I've embraced it. Okay, okay. Got it, got it, got it. So, before we left, mm -hmm. we talked about the moment you yeah. realized that you was a black man. Hmm. Two come to mind. I have to go back to my childhood on the first one, the okay. segue in, XL Powell, who was my biological father, who came back in my life when I was a third grader, mm. grammar school. He went off to Michigan, Detroit, like a lot of brothers did, to find work, to find right. a better life. So he came back into my life then, and we've been close ever since. Thank God for that. Well, I was visiting for the summer, and I have three brothers there, Steve, Tony, and Michael. Right. So they're showing me a good time, we're at the mall. Got ice cream and we're at the mall. So his wife, Claudette, she's looking at furniture and dad's holding baby Steve and we're all walking around just kind of playing, doing what boys do. Right. And there were some white kids there as well. They were jumping over sofas, standing on tables and stomping. Well, dad, was adjusting Steve's clothes on him, and he took Steve out of his arms and put him on a coffee table. And when he put him on the coffee table, as soon as the soles of his feet, this white salesman comes over and says, sir, sir, get him off that table, get him off that table. Well, speaking of rage, you just mentioned, XL Paul, my father is 6'3", and he's mm -hmm. a man's man. Mm -hmm. He takes no junk from nobody. Mm. He went into this spiel, engaging this salesman. And to be honest with you, what he said to him, he said, when you get off, I'll be waiting on you outside. Now, here we are all these years later. That salesman's probably huddled up in that store somewhere <laughs> afraid to come out. <laughs> so the lecture, we left the store, didn't patronize them. We left the store. The conversation in the car was, 
love yourself, you have dignity, nobody can tell you or treat you any different unless you allow them to do that. So that stuck with me. Wow. So the black pride and instilling confidence, self-awareness, being comfortable in your own skin, uh, it may sound a little kumbaya, but it was just always in my life space. Right. Now, transitioning to high school, being a good student, right. great athlete, and uh, going over to Kingsbury, I was bused there, and there was some, lit some litigious issues with Northside, and we don't have time for that, and some right. other schools right. that wanted to sue my parents and get me to come there, so I go over to Kingsbury, white school. So I noticed when I got there, all the teachers and the principals had walkie-talkies, and I'm like, you know, it was a little different from Cyprus. You know, we right. didn't have that. So... Got off to a really good start, and here again, I've always prided myself in being a trendsetter. Right. And of course, basketball, football, track, you're embellished with a lot of white students. And right. somehow, some way, I rose to the top early on as a sophomore there. Okay. And went through school, and just everybody uh, patting me on the back, shaking my hand, and just right. always thrusting me out front in the paper all the time for recognition academically and basketball or track football, what have you. Mm -hmm. So my senior year, fast forward to my senior year, I have all these accolades behind me, all of this, this decoration of uh, being a good student athlete. Right. So when it's time to vote for Mr. Kingsbury, they don't have a vote. They do a private secret vote. And the young man who I was really good friends with actually won it. And it was not really important to me, but I think it was important to the people around me that my teammates and classmates, they thought it was unfair. But I was kind of focused on what was next for me, so I really paid it no mind. So obviously what it was, the color of my skin. Right. But it didn't deter me uh, to finish the school year out strong, and I'll, I'll take a lot of pride in this, more so than have, being the MVP for two years, my junior year, my senior year in basketball, and winning other awards in track and football, what have you, was my senior year, I was recognized with the Falcon Award. Okay. And I was the first student that had ever won that award. And what the award stands for is bringing revenue to the school, mm. recognition to the school, and heighten the school's status. Right. So with my basketball prowess, the gym was always packed, so it was a sellout every time we played. And then, of course, I was in the paper for academics and leadership stuff. So I feel real good behind that. So it was somewhat of, uh, I guess, uh, redemption, right. so to speak. But blatantly, it was the fact that, you know, Tim, he's a great guy, but he's black. Mm. Wow. Period. Okay. What role did Memphis play in your development as an executive? Everything. Uh, I go back to the school system, the village that I was raised in right. with uh, having a father, a mother, and then a stepfather who supported me unwaveringly from Detroit, Michigan. Okay. And uh, I just could not have asked for more. And then our, and I really think I want to give props to my, my junior high coaches, Dr. James Barber, may he rest in peace. He was an academician, but he was an outstanding athlete as well. He mm -hmm. pushed academics. Right. And he would come, now he's the principal. He would come to school early to work with me on my weekend. I'm a Southpaw. I right. think you remember that, don't you? Right, right. <laughs> and he, on my weekend, he had just had me doing stuff with my, he's the principal now. Mm. But he, and the coaches, it was like having another father. Right. It was like, it, and everything was like seamless. So in terms of getting in trouble, it was one of those deals where my reputation uh, preceded me so much. If, if a guy was doing a blunt or something or whatever, when I walked up, they say, here come Tim, please don't take that as self-righteous. That, <laughs> that is not what I'm saying here, but I'm just kind of giving you right. my story. Right. So confidence, responsibility was espoused at a very early age because right. when you think about success, we were talking about that off camera, 87.5% mm -hmm. of your success in any field, any capacity, is your attitude. 12.5% right. is skill. Right. So having the right attitude, I was taught early on how to behave. 
and just kind of built on that platform. So school system, my upbringing, and just being at church at an early age all played a part in who I am today. What role or what impact did your stepfather have on the man that you are today? Everything, everything. He was the first one at my games. He taught me how to date. He taught me how to talk to women. He taught me how to interface with females. And he helped me accountable. Mm -hmm. And he taught me a strong work ethic. Okay. So he played a very pivotal role in okay. my life for sure. Absolutely. Okay. So when you looked across that room and you saw what became the Mrs., tell me about that moment. It was love at first sight. Really? We were high school sweethearts. That okay. generally does not work out. Right. And the reason that it worked out, <laughs> because she's just so wise and such a uh -huh. old soul. So y'all been together since Man, listen, high school. Absolutely. Three kids 77, later? two kids. Two kids later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Tim's 37 and Bria's 33. They're both here in Memphis so and doing well. So you don't even know life without I this. have absolutely no inkling what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> so she... She is, uh, she's the, uh, she's the love of my life. She's the backbone of the family. You're talking about wise beyond her years and just keeping the family steady, keeping me steady as I move through uh, being a man and right. matriculating through college away from home and basketball not working out. Right, right. And uh, she was right there. You made the move career-wise to FedEx. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that and where was she in that decision? She was right there. She was right there when I first started FedEx. Help shortly me. thereafter, uh, she was pregnant with Tim. Okay. And uh, so we went through that journey together. And I started, like most folk, started part time handling packages. And uh, but I am the type of person. I was a criminology major in college, so I'm looking around at all these uniform guys with guns on, and I'm like, hmm, that looks pretty interesting. But in right. But I, and I guess it was a litigious issue that they was trying to avoid in orientation when I was hired as a package handler. Mm -hmm. They would say, look, every, every uh, section, they would say, please do not try to apply for anything full time. You must wait a year or maybe longer than a year because they didn't want to disappoint anybody. But I guess mm -hmm. people had started filing stuff because as right. soon as they got out of HUB, okay, they get training, they would try right. to file. So. Well, I did the same thing. I, I'll never forget it. I went to HR one Friday night. I went in early and uh, I had been out of um, orientation for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went in and I saw this, this white lady. I can't remember her name. I said, I'm looking for the manager of security. So, oh, his office is right down there, Willie Parks. He was on the phone. He had his feet up on his desk and uh, he looked at me and he said, come in. So I just kind of stood there with my, my my brogans, we didn't have uniforms back then, just whatever you can wear, steel uh -huh. toe boots, sweatshirt and jeans or uh -huh. whatever. So he got off the phone, he said, hey brother, how can I help you? He was a real cool dude, mm -hmm. love, love Willie. And uh, said, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in the security department. Said, oh yeah? And then he kind of looked at me up and down, so he knew I worked in the hub by the way I was dressed. Right. And uh, he said, well, uh, uh, Tim, let me ask you, true story. How long have you been working here? I said, for two weeks. He literally rolled on the floor and just laughed because he already knew they told me in orientation, don't even come, uh -huh. maybe a year. And it's two, and I looked at him straight in the face. So as he was rolling around on the floor laughing, I just kind of stood there and waited till we can get back to some business, some right. conversation. And he saw that I did not laugh. He said, you know what? I like your style. And within, I think, eight months, the rest is history. Wow. The rest is history. So... The day that you became the CEO's personal security, uh -huh. what was that day like? Here again. I can't even imagine when they passed the keys up <laughs> to you on that one. <laughs> what happened with that, Larry, was, uh, and I got to give you this quick story if I can okay. real quick, okay. Beverly yeah. McGee. When <clears throat> I talked to Willie, I applied. And I interviewed, but I had a full beard at the time. And I didn't cut it off before the interview process. And it was like six people, and I'm like, I killed this interview. I, I didn't 
killed. So, but I had a lot of logistical background, criminology classroom, but nothing on practical, nothing on the job law right. enforcement. So, so they called me and told me that I was rejected. Okay, and they sent me a letter, so I'm on my, my shipping, uh, receiving job, and I'm calling and trying to talk to somebody. So I finally get a person on the phone, and uh, I'm talking. I said, listen, I really would like to be in the security department, I'm really strongly interested. Uh, right. I'd like to talk to somebody about maybe uh, trying again. And I kept calling, they said, well, let me, let me, Mr. Bowers, let me have you talk to somebody else. So I finally got somebody that would talk to me, sit down and talk with me. So when they hired me as a uniform officer, uh, Beverly McGee was my first manager, first day on the job. She said, you know why I hired you? I said, no, ma'am, I don't, but I just believe in God. A uh, young fella, was that 83, Whew, 84, uh -huh. that was 84. Uh -huh. So she said, we sent out 150 rejection letters and we called 150 people because of some legal issues and we rejected everybody. You were the only one that called us back. Mm. So never give up. Keep the faith. Be persistent. Believe in yourself. Keep trying. Wow. So once I get into the uniform division, I'm in the uniform division a couple of years, right. and I start seeing this executive security entourage, and I'm like, hmm, that looks interesting. Here I go again. Right. So I went in to talk to my manager at the time, Todd Undra. He uh -huh. recently retired. Todd, what's up, Todd? And uh, I said, listen, Todd, do you have any insights on uh, the executive protection unit? Here's what he told me, true story. He says, it's funny you ask. They're watching you. So they had been looking at me. You never know who's watching. You never know who's watching you. You never know who's watching you. Your smile is your logo. Mm. Your personality is your business card. And how you make people feel when they have an experience with you right. becomes your trademark. Mm. Real talk. One, time. one so, more time. One more time. Okay. For those slow. In the <laughs> All back. right. Your smile is your logo. Okay. Your personality is your business card. Right. And how you make people feel when they're around you becomes your trademark. So the rest is history. Of course, I had to go through a strenuous executive processing, vetting, right. meeting all the executives, and, and the rest is history. Wow. It was very exhilarating uh, to, to come over to executive protection. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, a few years, I managed it for wow. 20 plus years before I left. And I want to say this in case we run out of time. I left with four African Americans on my staff. Three are from Memphis. Three brothers are from Memphis. And Anthony, he might as well be from Memphis. He played at Memphis State years ago. He's still a native Memphian now. So I feel real good about that. And when I left, the person that uh, took my place is a brother. Wow. So Terrell Benet, I, I take a lot of pride in that, Larry. Okay. I, I, I guess early on in life with the confidence and love from the family, I was able to interface with whoever because I was comfortable in my own skin. Right. And I've gone to bat for many, many people behind the scenes. People will never know those stories. Okay. Now, and, uh, you're going back. Yeah. You're going back. North Memphis. North Memphis. Yes. Yes. You walk in the door. You see a little kid sitting there watching cartoons. Look at the kid. It's little Tim Bowers. What would you say to that kid? Here's what I would say to that kid. You're valued, you are a living soul. You're God's creation, and there are three particular things about you and every other person in humanity. Your mind, what you think, your will, what you desire, and your emotions, how you feel. You must be very, very careful with how you respond to negativity. Because there's always somebody that has a spirit of memory that wants to bring up old stuff when you're trying to track and be positive and move in a positive direction. So always surround yourself best you can with people that are going in the right direction and always have high standards for yourself. You think with your mind, that's your knowledge. Your hands are the application of your work 
and your heart the transformation of being positive and being a productive person. And always have a standard of excellence. And remember this if you can. Good, better, best. Never let it rest until your good is better and your better is best. Let me say it again. Good, better, best. Never let it rest until your good is better and your better is best. I can't say no more. Other than this, listen to the rhythm of your own calling and follow that. Because that's what's going to lead you to success. I'm Larry Robinson. For our guest, Brother Tim Bless Bowers, brother. thank you, sir. Thank you for <laughs> all those pearls of wisdom. My honor to be here. I keep telling you, we're going to keep bringing them. You keep coming back. I'm Larry Robinson with The Journey. Take care. Thank you to our partner, the Grand Boulet of Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity Delta Chapter. To hear more incredible stories like this, be sure to download the Kazookian app from the App Store or Google Play or check out the Journey Memphis podcast on all your major podcast providers. Also, check us out on the Kazookian Network.